Welcome to Tent Talk, the podcast with Nancy McCready, where we talk about life under the big tent of God's presence and the provoking process of discipleship. Here we go. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Tent Talk. This is Nancy McCready. Welcome to a series of conversations where I am going to draw excerpts from my book, From Trauma to Trust. But hold on, my friends. This is not just a reading. This is a provoking into conversations that we must have where we must see where the traumas of our childhood, now this is for men and women, and how those same things, when they remain unresolved, uncrucified, unrecognized, still run rampant and can cause us to come under the control of things even today in our society, in culture, in politics, in religion, in our churches, wherever systems may be. My friends, we cannot be those who are being controlled. We need to be those who are going to be the proving ground for everything that we preach. Just like Jesus. That we understand that when we step forward, where we may have been threatened as children, and you're going to be embarrassed, you're going to be humiliated, you're going to be harmed, you're, okay, and then today you hear those same things, that if we speak truth, those are the same things that will happen to us. We have to step out from being controlled, my friends, and we need to step now into his life and the forming of his life within us, and we need to be those who will tell the truth. No longer will we be silent. Oh, sure, there's some excerpts from my book that I read from, but there's a whole lot more. So stay tuned, my friends. Stay turned in to right here on Tent Talk Podcast, and I pray these provoking conversations are going to grip you and get a hold of you. So take a listen. And I hope that I'll hear from you. And I hope it'll awaken you. Let's get ready for the hour of history in which we live. Love you all. I'm so looking forward to this episode. Here we are connecting the dots. We are allowing Holy Spirit to connect things that have happened in the past to ways that we might be uh, manipulated even today as rational, reasonable adults, and we don't see the connection. Many times when I'm working with people, God begins to build a bridge from the past to the present or the present to the past. And why is it that we're open to such things when we claim Christ as our Lord, as our life, We are Christians, but are we sons? Are we those who are truly following him, adapting to him in all things? If we are, my friends, that means we will not be adapting to uh, the current climate uh, of philosophy, of culture. Remember, Galatians 6.14 says, The world has been crucified to me. And I have been crucified to the world. My friends, the world system cannot be what is shaping and forming and controlling you. We must be those who are wise and we're getting above the fray. We've got to come outside of certain things and we have to know there are options. But if you've lived in a brain freeze, my friends, since you were a child, That when there is conflict, confrontation, difficulty, you go into a place of a scrambled brain, trauma brain. That's not being, you know, psychobabble, my friends. That's just using language that can be understood today. But we have to always remember, we can identify many things, but solution is going to be where the, the line is drawn, if you will. What is our solution? Right? Are we living in that place of great loyalty in life with the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, with the Godhead, what they're after, what they've always desired? Or are we falling prey to being cultural Christians who try to wax clever with all of these things? My friends, we, we do not need to be clever. We need to have cross-infused wisdom coming to us, the mind of Christ. So here's what I want to do today. I'm only going to read certain portions of chapter one. I told you that, you know, I wasn't quite sure how I was going to proceed. And again, as you're listening to this, 
I am getting deeper and deeper into my time in Europe, and uh, hopefully you're catching some of the Here We Go episodes, the ones where I'm on the ground uh, in real time uh, in other nations, other um, cultures, societies, things that I'm being provoked have to look at, whether it's in, um, you know, NMM assignments, my friends, in my deep personal life with my family. Really, it's all that one life, isn't it? So I want you to just stay with me in this, and I want to share some things with you that I hope will open up um that will open up the horizons of your life in this hour of history. If our discipleship is not preparing us, if the pulpits that we're listening to are not preparing us for the real-time engagement with the Father and with culture, being sent out, my friends, like arrows in the hands of God, right? Then, then what really are we doing? Are we just listening to nice stories, nice sermons, saying thank you? I'll, you know, I'll be back in next week to check and see how you're doing, and if you entertain me, you know. But is it equipping you? Is it forming and fashioning Christ in you? Okay, I've got, I've got to stop a little bit here. Okay, back up. <laughs> I'm reading out of uh, my book, From Trauma to Trust, Chapter One: The Devastation of Innocence, The Beginnings of Bitterness. My father walked out and left me, but God took me in. Psalm 2710 from the Message Bible. Have you ever felt like life is just one big contradiction? I know I have. I cannot tell you how many times I sang the old song, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know, over and over and over again. Even with the sexual abuse of my dad fresh on my body, I sang the songs of the Lord. That, my friends, is a big contradiction in life to sing of being loved while bearing the marks of abuse. Yes, that is an intense statement, but it was my reality. I can't remember a time in my life that I didn't know who Jesus was and didn't believe the Bible was the Word of God. I had accepted Jesus into my heart as a seven-year-old girl and spent most Sunday afternoons of my adolescence in Bible sword drills and all my summers at vacation Bible school and church camp. I sang with the choir and always ate dinner at church, on Wednesday evenings, there was never a question as to whether or not my mom and her five children would be at a Sunday school or a church service. We would be there. My earliest memories are a deep mixture of innocence and horror. I would innocently seek out my dad for a hug or a kiss, which almost always led to the horror of an encounter with molestation. Out of my childlike need for love and affection, I would approach him and be taken advantage of. Being young, needy, and vulnerable made me easy prey. Hearing my dad move through the house early in the morning always filled me with terrifying tension. He was a great whistler and would often whistle as he approached my room. My thoughts would begin to tighten as I braced my body for another encounter with evil. My mind became my panic room. I ran to it each time I heard him coming. Like hunted prey paralyzed with the anticipation of total powerlessness, I lay still and complied. My mental muscles were being exercised often, and their feigned strength allowed me a temporary place to escape. I hated being needy, vulnerable, and open. I hated being so gullible, naive, and stupid as to approach my dad repeatedly. I was also receiving a shame-filled message from the accuser that said, what is it about me that makes a grown man do these things? The devil was more than glad to supply the hellish answer. You must have some special power over people. Seduction isn't ultimately about sex or beauty. It is about power and control. It whispers, I can make you do what I want you to do. This began the development of my very deep and conflicting dynamic with men. I envied their positions of power and lusted for their approval all at the same time. Eventually, I realized this applied not only to men, but to all those in authority. Can you feel how conflicting and complex trauma is? I can remember the subtle ways my dad would exert this covert control over me as a young girl, even when we sat on the sofa in our den. Other family members were present, yet he would maneuver ever so slightly so that it was not discerned by the natural eye. I was disgusted, but paralyzed. 
When I've visited my childhood home as an adult, I've been amazed at how little space there is between the rooms. Everything seemed so much bigger when I was young. Yet when I would go back to visit as an adult, it all looked so confined. How could he have done this with my mother and other siblings so close? I wonder how he knew I would keep quiet. I often had people ask me how an abuser can be so bold as to do such things with others around. Don't they worry about someone telling? It will be helpful to never forget that this thing, this abusive, seductive spirit, feeds on domination and control. It banks everything on the silence of its prey. It is a demonic boldness that breeds intimidation and powerlessness in its victims. It is predatory and feels quite safe to maneuver in stealth and silence while stealing your security and safety. If you have never been in this kind of situation, I know it is difficult to understand why I didn't yell, scream, run, or report it. Yet I'm sure every victim reading or listening to this understands the dominating hush that comes over you. Now I want to hop over uh, a little deeper into the chapter, my friends. I appeared one way on the outside and something totally different on the inside. This would become a way of life for me, public pretense versus private reality. The dual aspects of my survival skills as a people pleaser, class clown, mischief maker, and closet self-hater kept me continually adapting to the things I couldn't change. I slowly grew to resent this deep contradiction within myself. It never dawned on me I had options. There was a deep rut being built by a powerful voice that was gaining great sway over me during these childhood days. I heard it again and again. There's nothing you can do about it. Intimidation and powerlessness were closing the door on any clarity I had. It was all blurring and bleeding over, and I couldn't tell where I started, and my dad stopped. I couldn't get him to stop, and I decided if I couldn't control him, I would control the pain. Now, my friends, there are many other things out of that particular chapter that I could share, but here's where I want to build the bridge in between what I've just read, the dominating hush that comes over you. When you literally believe, because there is a power at work, you literally believe, though there is much confusion, strife, frustration, and oppression happening within you, you literally believe there's nothing you can do. Now, no matter what circumstances you may have lived in and lived through, it might not have been sexual abuse, but it might have. Remember, this is for men and women. Men and women. That when something so bold walks up to you, touches you, violates you, or maybe just speaks to you, and that dominating hush comes over you. And at first you're shocked. You're like, did that actually just happen? Or is this actually happening? Because it's so bold, my friends, in the way that it grips you. That you think, surely that did not happen. Or you think, if I tell somebody, they're going to be like, that's crazy. That could never happen. Because we think oftentimes abusers, situations like this... People who are so, um, you know, power hungry, surely they wouldn't just operate like right out in <laughs> open spaces where people can see them. Oh, yes, they would. Oh, yes, they would. Much like how things are operating today, my friends, in lives, homes, nations. M my friends, listen carefully to me. We, we do know how things will openly just function. And like everybody stands around going, does anybody see what's happening? Is anybody going to do anything? And it is so bold and will barrel through so strongly 
that eventually, my friends, it's like it sucks the life right out of you, all the energy to do anything, because the frustration is so great, it leads to an almost automatic discouragement and a belief. There's nothing we can do about it. I mean, we're just, we're just going to have to live with this, I guess. Okay, now I want you to watch this. That something that's called an affordance trap. Some would call it psychological tricks, uh, things like that. You find that what you thought was only happening in your home of origin, right? That you thought this is only happening here. You know, we are the strange family on the block, right? Come to find out much later, my friends, you find out, wait just a minute. <laughs> I think there's like, a, there's something that's, that's happening that has a name. Right, I can remember in my own life, I can remember, and I know this may sound strange, but somebody out there is going to understand what I'm sharing. I'm hoping there's many somebodies. I can remember living through abuse and thinking, of course, it's only me. And one of the smallest rays of hope, it didn't rescue me out. It didn't cause me to, you know, um, you know, resist, you know, the abuse or, or break out in some heroic fashion. But what it did do was give me this very strange glimmer of hope somehow that I wasn't alone. It wasn't just me. Was I saw on the cover of a magazine. Now remember, this is back in the probably the late 60s, early 70s. Um, an article on the cover of a magazine about incest. I'm pretty sure that was the topic they used at that point. And I remember glancing down almost simultaneously and seeing the circulation number for the magazine. For those of you that were of my generation, you might remember this. How it would say, you know, how many households it was going to or how many copies were in production. And I remember thinking they couldn't possibly be writing that if it was just for me. So this must mean that there are others out there in this secret, strange world that is that which lives under the veneer of man's goodness. You do know there's an entire uh, culture, an entire way of living, my friends, and it's being exposed today. That's why everybody's like, it's either a conspiracy theory or we are in deep trouble. Okay. And so, so you, you realize when you've lived under that and you realize not everybody that's acting a certain way is really that way. Okay. So here's what I want you to understand is there's, there's a name for this where you're made to believe there are only two options and you've got to go either way. Either let me abuse you or ruin your family by telling this, this secret, my friends. Mm-mm. See, it took me a little while to realize there are options. There are options for living. Because growing up, when it said, I didn't even know that there were options. The way I actually wrote it was, it never dawned on me I had options. It was either keep silent or ruin everything. Okay, now as a child, which one are you going with? I'm going to ruin my mother's life. I'm going to ruin my family's life. I'm going to be responsible. And that's what abusers tell you. The weight of everything is on you. Now, shh. Don't tell anybody. Because then you know what will happen. You know how upset your mother will be or whatever the circumstances may be. Or if you're watching your dad abuse your mother, beat her where blood is splattering all over the, the place, and you're told it's her fault or it's your fault because when I came home, you kids were misbehaving and this was happening and if you wouldn't nag, right? I mean, I could go on and on with uh, options here, my friends, of, of excuses and blaming rationalizations, full-out denials, full-out lying, and yet you're looked at and told now it's your responsibility, not my responsibility as an adult, 
speaking as the abuser now, to change my behavior. No, no, no. It's your responsibility to keep quiet. Because what did I read? That this bold thing, what does it do? It completely relies upon the silence of its prey. This is why, my friends, if you look currently, now I'm speaking to people who live in the United States right now at this moment, but you could look at it in any government, in any nation, because the condition of mankind is pervasive and universal. Is that if you look at the United States, sometimes you have to look up at at Washington, D.C., and you love your country, you want to you want it to be the best. You're not under any illusions that there's a perfect party, a perfect government, perfect people, but like this nation was founded on a on a way of doing things that uh, takes many things into account and then lays out systems and branches of government and things like that for things to function. And yet today you look up there and you're thinking, what in the world must be going on? It's like everybody's acting like they're an elected official representing the people. And they may even feign how upset they are and how offended. But when it comes time to vote or to do anything, you're like, what is going on up there? Well, I'm just going to suggest to you, I'm just going to go out on a limb and tell you, I think they've all got dirt on each other. (laughs) I think everybody's counting on the silence of everybody. And let's just keep going and we will play our parts in front of the microphones and the cameras. But down deep, we all know we are absolutely in a blackmail battalion. Because I, I will do what you say because that's what I did so I could get this seat on this particular committee. And I won't say anything, right, because I know that if I do, you're going to tell what I've been doing in secret. Um, you know, you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. And Okay, I mean, we're all capable of it. I mean, we all do it to some extent. That's what we say to ourselves. But my friends, there's something going on because there are people that literally are banking on the silence of their prey. The silence. And so if we don't think that that which affected us deeply when we were growing up now for men and women, and that it's not still working today, my friends, we're, we are living in a, in a way that is not fully dunked in the truth. Mm-hmm. Now, I've noticed in these last two or three episodes, I keep hitting and kissing the 20 to 25 minute mark. I'm breaking my own rules here. I have a 15 to 17 minute mark that I'm always trying to hit. And here I am. I've already kissed right up on going across that. So I'm going to stop for today. But I am going to, in this next episode, I'm going to talk to you about affordance traps and how that is a psychological trick to make people currently and presently today think there's only two options. My friends, we have options and we best know it. And we must break out of our old bondages. And we better understand that coming unto Christ and living free unto him is also going to have everything to do with living free in uh, culture, society, life, and furthering his kingdom in the hearts of people. All right, then. There you have it. Think on these things. Stay with me in this. Here we go. I'm stepping in here at the end of this episode to make sure that you know there are other resources available through Nancy McCready Ministries that will help you to drill down deeper into what God may be speaking to you right now. Go to nancymccready.com. You can see there all of our resources, the Producers Way School. You will be able to uh, connect with our YouTube channel. We want to make sure that you know that there are at your fingertips, resources where you can begin to let God speak to you daily and just stay with Him in the slow fire as He matures you. And we would appreciate any sharing of our content that you would pass on to others what you're hearing, what you're learning, and encourage them also to step in to the provoking process of discipleship. So I want to take this opportunity 
to also thank you for being part of the Tent Talk family. Tent Talk is the podcast of Nancy McCready Ministries, and we appreciate all of your support, and we are so proud to be a part of what God is doing in your heart and in your life as we prepare for the days that we live in. Love you all.